this is intended to be a discussion of a chapter in Theory and Practice by Jürgen Habermas, Chapter 2 on Natural Law and Revolution. So the main point that Habermas is trying to get across in this chapter is that there was a shift in the way people thought about natural law during the time period of the French Revolution, and that this was a powerful force in bringing about social change. Now, I suppose you could question the extent to which philosophical thinking has ever genuinely led to change in society insofar as enacting people to get together and have a revolution. But what Habermas tries to bring together is a picture of statesmen who have read people like Locke, Hobbes, and Rousseau, and are using some of the ideas of those philosophers to found a new social order based upon liberal principles, liberal in the classical sense, in the, in the sense that they want to create a society whose main objective is to create a f situation where the freedom of all individuals is respected. And by freedom, we should understand political freedom. Political freedom begins with understanding and validating the idea that human beings should be uh, endowed with certain rights. And those principles were principles that were brought together and enunciated in the works of Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau. And those principles were intended to be justified through the thought experiment of trying to understand what philosophy, what society might be like prior to any social order being imposed upon mankind as it existed in a state of nature. One of the major motivations for the revolutionaries of the French Revolution, according to the picture that Habermas puts together, was to try to maintain the rights that human beings would have in a state of nature that might have been taken away from them through the evolution of political society that um, had eventuated in the time period they were living in. So, the vicissitudes of history, let us say, um, could be understood as having created a political order that may not be really in the best interests of mankind. It, it could be said to have eventuated in a political order that was out of touch with the nature of human beings themselves, making human beings, the people that make up social orders, feel like they were being subject to an unjust domination of their kings or lords or whoever the authority figure might be in their society. And they sought to overthrow that domination and return to the people of society, the common people, the rights that they would have been endowed with in a state of nature as far as possible. And so to envision a society in which those rights were respected and maintained is really the goal of a liberal society, one that tries to put the liberty and freedom of people first as a basic principle of and a guiding principle of the working of the government that um, stands above them and, according to liberal-minded thinking, is intended to serve them 
Okay, so returning for just a moment to the idea of natural law, the medieval conception of natural law was seen as going hand in hand with that sort of domination, the kind of society that had grown up with its tiers of um, aristocracy and um, craftsmen and serfs and those layers of society that had grown up where you had lords and servants, you had masters and slaves in some cases. And they sought to overthrow that and the philosophical impetus that really was intended to provide a justification and valorization of that revolutionary point of view was a new view of natural law, which is simply the idea that the, in a state of nature, human beings have a natural-born freedom, natural-born liberty, and the only authority that a government should be granted is the authority to maintain a society that allows for the greatest extent of freedom and liberty that it can allow. Okay, so with that as kind of a um, general introduction to the subject that Habermas is undertaking here, if we look at the very first section in Chapter 2, the title is The Bourgeois Revolution's Philosophical Understanding of Itself the positivization of natural law as the realization of philosophy. And maybe those of you who know something about Hegel can already sense a Hegelian slant in the way that Habermas is framing this whole subject matter. We can see here there's a positivization of natural law um, as one of the main topics, which is the actualization of a philosophical concept, the actualization of a concept that's born out of reason, that's being brought to life in the world. So Habermas is going to explain how the French Revolution is an example of that. Um, the realization of philosophy, he's going to try to make a case that the politicians who were behind the French Revolution really did want to take the theory behind these new ideas about natural law and make them a social force, make them a force in society. So one of the main groups that Habermas discusses is the physiocrats. And an important point that he brings up about the physiocrats is that one of their main objectives was to make sure that the principles of the revolution were not something that were just discussed in um, political chambers where the influence of those ideas would not extend to the people themselves. They wanted to make sure that the revolution, that the ideals of the revolution were ideals that lived in the hearts of the people and not merely um, treated as abstract principles that had no real life to them. So the physiocrats, as far as um, you know, Habermas paints the picture, can be associated with the idea of the philosoph, somebody who, like Socrates, is not somebody who has their whole life merely devoted to theory but also has devoted themselves to the practical aspects of how their theory might be implemented in the world and how that theory might change society for the better. So there's a lot at stake for somebody with a genuinely revolutionary way of thinking to to step out of a merely theoretical stance and step into a stance where your intention is actually to change the world 
through the development and propagation of theories is something more than what your quote-unquote academic philosopher might want to be implicated in. But people like the physiocrats had an idea that the people who would be able to bring about these truly revolutionary changes in society would have to be people like Socrates. They would have to conform to the ideal of the philosoph who is engaged in society. And when we get to chapter 3, we get a clearer picture of exactly what this means in terms of bringing theory and practice together as one. So if an idea has merely theoretical value and doesn't actually have force to change society, then a critical theorist like Habermas and the revolutionaries that Habermas is describing won't have much use for it. Instead, every theory has to have a practical orientation toward its own realization if it's going to have any real um, interest for a critical theorist or for a revolutionary um, in the mold of the physiocrats. Now, this is not to say that everybody who has a theory who wants to put it into practice is automatically justified simply by the fact that they are willing to do that. You know, if we, if we think about this in the context of Hegel, reason itself has to have some sort of compelling claim upon people. It has to be powerful enough and sensible enough so that it can compel people to change their behavior of themselves. And it has to have enough of a compelling force, enough of a sensibility to it, that enough people will be able to latch onto it and make it a force in their own lives to change their behavior. And I suppose a good example of that would be the social consciousness that we might have about the environment and how far we're willing to go when it comes to balancing out the claims of the world of economics and business against the long-term sensibility and reasonability of taking care of the planet. You know, another example would be the situation with factory farming. And I think a lot of people these days are becoming more and more aware, and there's a greater and greater consciousness of where their food comes from. And they're beginning to think more and more about whether it's just to purchase certain items or if it's better to purchase some items over others. But until there comes a time when it really becomes a motive force in people's lives so that they're willing to carry it out in practice, that social change may not be entirely enacted. And of course, the situation is rather complex. And when you have the force of government behind that social change, of course, it can be enacted more readily. But for Habermas and for the physiocrats, the people in the French Revolution, they wanted to make sure that that force of government that can make these changes happen wasn't merely carried out in the name of the government, but carried out in the name of the people. And no genuine revolutionary force, if it is to be a genuine revolutionary force, can proceed as such without the um, practical daily living out of that theory in practice. And you need to have the minds and hearts of the people behind it in order to make that possible. So Habermas is reflecting on the French Revolution. And to me, a lot of these ideas are very um, 
closely tied to the way that he reads Hegel. And right now I'm bringing in some of the ideas of chapter three to illuminate the discussion of chapter two, to try to describe the kind of force that these ideas are meant to have. So if we look at the next section, um, which is entitled The Meaning of Declaration in the American and in the French Declarations of the Rights of Man, in this chapter, a couple of important points are Habermas's treatment of Thomas Paine and his depiction of the um, colonial situation in the United States as being radically different from the situation in France. That these two kinds of revolutions are actually quite different as far as Habermas is concerned. And what he actually says about the American Revolution is that it was never truly a revolution because the situation in the United States at the time of the foundation of the United States as a nation was such that no true uh, alteration, let's say, no true internal revolution in the way that people felt as a um, total social body had to be achieved in order for social change to be achieved. So the situation that he's working with to try to bring that out is that the early American colonists, uh, according to the sources that he's using, were a much more homogeneous group than the group that you would see in French society. French society has a long tradition of aristocracy, um, strong central government. Um, the, um, the social order that um, prevailed in France at the time period had deep roots in the norms of French society. Where, whereas if you look at American society, it was basically already set up to reflect liberal social values. If you look at the American colonists, this much more homogeneous group, the quote that Habermas provides paints the picture of a group of shopkeepers. And you can easily imagine how a group of shopkeepers might want to have their rights respected and want to be left alone, and in particular to be granted freedom to the extent that they're able to carry on with their lives and prosper economically. And for Habermas, Habermas tries to make the argument that it's a very easy transition to go from that state of society to framing a constitution with liberal social principles. And he talks about Thomas Paine as a writer who basically has in mind the idea that an economic um, way of life, which is basically already set up, to espouse the ideals of uh, liberty and freedom, which is capitalism, is of itself a, enough of a factor in social change to change any society. So if you're already a capitalist culture, which is what the United States was, if you're a nation of shopkeepers, the step to simply enacting your ideals as the um, constitutional values of the society that you live in is not a difficult step to make. But for people in France, the time of the French Revolution, much more had to be done. And Habermas talks about uh, Thomas Jefferson visiting France and having discussions with various political figures in France. And these political figures will say, 
he quotes them as saying that basically it really has to be understood what kind of difference there is between trying to make French society with its deep historical traditions into a liberal society and a society that has basically been started from scratch from a group of colonies. So if we look at the next set of sections here, what is going to be worked out is exactly how the natural law, the philosophy of natural law, as a philosophy of bourgeois values, um, middle class values, comes to be enacted in French culture. And uh, he, he brings out um, Lockean ideals, um, the natural right to freedom, life, property, um, that the state should not uh, suspend those rights, those rights should not be infringed upon in any way, and of the sanctity of the um, value of the individual in society, that individuality goes hand in hand with those basic rights that are actually the foundation of a liberal political order. And of course, if we look at this from the Marxist perspective that Habermas introduces in the following sections, it is easy to kind of understand how these pieces fall together so that you can see the transition to a liberal state in the United States and in France as a, tr as a transition toward a state that it has enacted middle class values as its basis. And you could look at this type of social order perhaps as a compromise between having the um, state founded basically on aristocratic principles on the one hand, and on the other hand, as a state that really makes the the people the foundation for um, the common people, the foundation for um, political society. Somebody like Rousseau would want to make the people the sovereign. He would want to make the people and uh, their will, what they would like to see enacted, the will of the state of the ho as a whole. Somebody like Hobbes, on the other hand, would want to have a king, a sovereign, who um, basically calls all the shots in an effort to try to maintain a liberal order of society as far as possible. So you could associate Hobbes with one side of the spectrum, which has more continuity with the medieval understanding of natural law, or on the other, somebody like Rousseau, who wants to swing in the opposite direction as being much more radical, a much more radical break from the medieval traditions, the medieval political order, in wanting to give all the power to the people, somebody willing to put um, trust in the will of the people to guide a society. So the last point that I'll make about this is just if we look at the last section, you know, what actually does Habermas have to say about all this? And what he brings out is basically his critique of a liberal political order. So what's wrong with a political society whose main or perhaps only goal is really to function so as to maintain the freedom of its citizens? And if it's functioning properly to allow them the maximum amount of freedom possible, which can be maintained in such a way that it doesn't take away the rights and freedoms of other people. 
what can be um, said about this social order. One of the main points is that the liberal political order for Habermas has basically run out of its revolutionary steam. And it's important for a political ideal to have a transformative effect in society for Habermas. He thinks that going back to the idea of a theory that has to be wedded to practice, a theory that is simply run out of steam is a theory that no longer has the vitality to enact social change that could be beneficial to society for causing it to evolve. So instead of people being fired up about um, the basic principles of freedom and liberty that people were able to um, harness, that, that were harnessed to get people to um, try to overthrow an existing political order that occurred in the 18th century, what is now the case is that they're having to look somewhere else. They have to look outside of the liberal ideology and try to find other theories, other ideas to put into practice in order to um, take further steps toward the evolution of society. He brings up the point that the original idea of a social contract has become discredited um, philosophically, academically, um, you know, in academic culture, which is part of the reason why it ceased to have very much influence. You know, when you, when you look at the writings of Locke and Hobbes and Rousseau, you know, at least at the time period when um, Habermas is writing about this, which is prior to Rawls, it's not hard to look at it and say, well, your idea of a social contract, trying to figure out what people might be like in a state of nature and then deducting from that the sort of rights that they ought to have, um, can certainly be called into question. We've had anthropologists go out and, and look at different tribes, and you know, part of that has been to try to understand what people in a state of nature have been like. And it's hard to imagine that you could, you could look at those empirical facts or empirical data and um, try to put together some sort of theory, you know, based upon that sort of data is exactly the sort of um, political culture that we should have reflected in our current political society. Instead, it seems like these ideas should remain as philosophical principles, as theoretical ideas. But the danger with that is that, going back to the theory and practice idea, if there is no impetus behind them, if, if reason isn't compelling us in some way to enact those values, then it really has run out of steam. It doesn't have that compelling revolutionary, evolutionary force that it really should have. And maybe it isn't so much a critique that you know, Habermas is bringing forward so much as it is maybe a description of exactly where we are historically with liberal political values. And it's not to say that people in the United States or elsewhere don't automatically have knee-jerk reactions about people trying to limit their freedom unjustly or um, the idea that these liberal values aren't important. It's more that they don't seem any longer to be a motivating force in changing people's behavior, in trying to um, push for 
to and to actualize a um, more evolved political order. So with that, I think enough has been said about chapter two. I think there's a lot in it that um, can be illuminated by his discussion of Hegel in chapter three. And if you look at chapter three together with chapter two, I think it's sort of an advertisement for exactly where he's going as far as his own ideas about um, critical theory and the way that critical theory can be framed um, as an important social force. So critical theory for Habermas is really his reading of Hegel, as far as I see it. It's really his interpretation of Hegel made into the ideology of critical theory itself. Maybe ideology isn't an appropriate word because there's no particular ideology behind critical theory uh, for somebody like Habermas, apart from the idea that, going back to the theory practice idea, a theory that merely sits out there as theory that was never intended to be actualized or won't face its own actualization seriously is not really a theory that is going to be of very much interest or that we should spend our lives trying to think seriously about. And maybe there is a place for that type of theorizing, but Habermas is more interested in the type of theory that is going to have a transformative effect insofar as he feels that some sort of transformation needs to take place in our culture to help it evolve and work toward another stage. 